Hi, this is your professor, Paul Narkunis, uh, providing a check-in video uh, to allow us to kind of finish up with some uh, basic information on Poe and kind of recap some issues both with um, the stories as well as some of your work up to this point. Um, uh, as you can see, I'm sitting here between with a interesting reflection, I guess it's on this side, an interesting light reflecting in a glass on glass. And this is a kind of itself a visual representation of the way in which Poe writes and thinks. Um, he's a, a, a writer primarily committed to how uh, perception really structures reality, okay, because uh, uh, this is an image of a light reflecting and uh, the characters that we've read in uh, these short stories are all people who uh, may in fact have a misguided sense of reality that structures their perception and therefore structures their reality. Uh, this is perhaps best represented by the telltale heart with the narrator kind of starting off saying, how could I be mad uh, considering how well I thought this out? And uh, uh, yeah, there's this, uh, you know, yeah, I, I killed him for the eye, but you know, the, the eye was hideous and it really bothered me. Um, again, these are this is this is an unreliable narrator, uh, but nevertheless, he's become so obsessed, so hyper focused on the eye that he can't see any other part of the reality. Uh, similarly, with the black cat, this is a, a a fascinating short story of somebody confessing uh, right before being put to death of of a crime. We don't learn until the end that he's actually killed his wife by mistake, um, but we have him being, you know, we have this character kind of revealed as somebody who, uh, when he drank, became another person, basically, like was taken over, uh, a demonic figure in many ways. Uh, and we're also introduced to uh, Poe's idea of perverseness, uh, a fascinating point where um, the narrator is trying to describe that those things that we're precisely told not to do, we derive pleasure doing. Uh, and there's no better way uh, to envision, uh, uh, you know, in guaranteeing that somebody should do something by telling them not to do it because of the pleasure of defying the law or defying the order. Uh, for those of you who have kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't have kids, uh, this is something to keep in mind. In any event, uh, this theory of perverseness is simultaneously his form of legitimation uh, for some of the heinous acts that he that he engages in, but it also gives us a certain sense of his uh, obsessive qualities, you know, much like the narrator in the Telltale Heart, his inability to uh, focus on any other things, and the very fact that this cat, uh, you know, why doesn't he just walk away from the cat or stop thinking about the cat, and all would be a whole lot better. Um, but that's what Poe is really trying to get us to look at, how obsession structures perception, which then structures reality, so that you, so that the, the various characters, narrators, uh, cannot see an alternative reality. Um, I haven't, up until this point, talked to you about Poe's biography, and there's a reason for that. Uh, Poe lived a very lurid life. Uh, it was a hard life. Uh, filled with considerable drama uh, and uh, was a little messed up. And as a result, uh, far too frequently, his biographers and, and uh, you know, people in pop culture and critics want to therefore read this messed up life as indicative of why Poe wrote these, story, these types of stories. Uh, Poe was a little more philosophical than that, and I think it's a uh, I think it's important to keep that in mind, uh, you know, with the you know, with some evidence, you know, provided from his own work. You know, he also invented the detective story, uh, which doesn't have anything to do with his dramatic life uh, and, and, and what happened during it. And uh, for those of you who would be interested, uh, there's another short story in the collection called The Gold Bug. Uh, we didn't read that. It's nevertheless a fantastic short story that if we had more time, we could potentially do. But um, this short story is an early introduction to what we now know as cryptography or code breaking. In fact, during World War II, code breakers would use Poe as a guide for how to think about codes and how to, how to break them. 
Uh, and the whole idea of cryptography, which is an extraordinarily form of, uh, important form of intelligence during wars, uh, and in fact, the United States probably won World War II because they've been able to break the codes of both the uh, Germans and Japanese, uh, owes no, perhaps some unrecognized debt to Poe's kind of inventing this interesting way of thinking about reality, reality as code. Now, for those of us living in the internet age, that's not a big stretch, but keeping in mind that when Poe was writing, there's no TV, uh, there's not even film. Uh, in fact, there's not even electricity. So we're talking about a very different moment uh, in history, and the human intellect really has to kind of uh, solve a lot of problems without the full advantages of technology. Uh, a quick rundown of some of Poe's lurid biography, okay, just to kind of get it out of the way. In Poe was born in 1809 uh, to two actors. Uh, by 1810, his father, David Poe, has abandoned the fact family. And by 1811, his mother, Elizabeth, has died of tuberculosis. Uh, Poe is then uh, raised by a family friend, uh, John Allen, uh, who was a tobacco merchant in Virginia. Uh, and Mr. Allen was very wealthy because he was a tobacco merchant, uh, but he was fairly tight-fisted, and he and Poe had a strained relationship in no small part because John Allen always kept, him, kept Poe at a distance. Uh, he never adopted him. He was never formally uh, recognized as a family member. And when John Allen dies, uh, Poe receives not a cent of this fortune. So, um, to say, you know, to say the least, Poe had some father issues, uh, both the absent father that abandoned him, and as well as this domineering figure who consistently uh, provided and did not provide in his life. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, Poe goes to the University of Virginia at around age 17. Um, while there, he's, at this moment in time, college is only for the wealthy. So he's surrounded by wealthy people, and he had been raised by John Allen with a lot of privilege because John Allen was very wealthy. Um, however, when he went to college, John Allen didn't give him any money to actually live on, and particularly not live on uh, in, in the situation that he was used to and that his compadres were all used to. So. Uh, to earn money, he gambled, and he wasn't very good at it. And so Poe had so many bad gambling debts that he basically had to leave the University of Virginia um, because of all the debt he accrued. Uh, this will become a recurring theme in, in Poe's life. He looks for a certain status, uh, but instead runs into tremendous debts. Uh, he later will join the military. This is kind of probably at John, uh, John Allen's behest uh, to try and learn some discipline. Uh, he's actually based in South, Sullivan Island, South Carolina uh, at this moment in time. This is before the Civil War, just to again remind you, because um, Sullivan Island is important during the Civil War. Um, and he drops out within two years. He then, at John Allen's behest, uh, goes to West Point. That doesn't work out. And again, he has to flee debts um, a year later. So um, Poe's life really only begins in, when he leaves the yoke of John Allen. Um, John Allen basically kind of disowns him, and Poe has to leave in, live in poverty, and he struggles for a number of years. John Allen finally dies in 1834. Uh, and Poe now no longer has that figure in his life. Uh, and that's when he seems to start to thrive at some level. Uh, he, in 1835, he marries his cousin, yes, his cousin, uh, who also is age 13. He's 26 at the time. So um, before you judge, her name was Virginia, uh, they lived a very wonderful life. Uh, they seem to really love each other until her uh, untimely death in 1847. Uh, and, you know, Poe is devastated by it. She dies of tuberculosis, which is a pretty common way to die at the time. Uh, but also, going back to 1835, this is when Poe 
John gets his first work as a literary critic. He starts writing for the Southern Literary Messenger, and he's very well respected for his literary criticism. In fact, he achieved success for literary criticism, if not tons of money, <coughs> well before he does for his writing. Okay, uh, So he starts out as a literary critic. He wants to just write poetry, which is his true passion at this time, but poetry does not pay, something to keep in mind for our aspiring poets out there. Uh, as well, he, um, he starts dabbling in the short stories. And most of his short stories, like the ones that we read, the ones that, were, that are revered today, are only published between 1841 and 1843. So it's a very you know, productive few years. Uh, this is important to keep in mind because uh, Poe dies very young. Uh, and uh, only in 1845, with the publication of The Raven, did people really take note of him as a major force of literary criticism, uh, most of, uh, I'm sorry, of, uh, of literature. Uh, the Raven was one of the, you know, the one work that was well received. Uh, most of his contemporaries didn't look down at his work because a lot of it was just fun, done for money. That's, it was fairly typical at that time just to write pieces for money, and that's why he did it. Um, at the same time, uh, this success doesn't mean that his life gets any better. Uh, throughout Poe's life, he also struggled with alcoholism. Um, uh, yet, there's a lot of debate about whether he was truly an alcoholic or he was allergic to alcohol or he was a manic depressive or, you, you know, he, he dies in 1849. So this is before the entire... Uh, discipline of psychology has formally been invented, so it's really hard to know what he, what in fact were were his issues. Um, <clears throat> but Poe, uh, going back to you know, let's going back to speaking of his death, dies in 1849 under very mysterious circumstances. He's basically found on the street, passed out, uh, and um, there's a, a couple of theories for this. Uh, one theory, one that I find particularly entertaining is uh, he was uh, in Baltimore at a time period when an elections were taking place. And American elections at this moment in time were liter everybody liter everybody's vote was literally bought. And that's kind of, that's how, you know, we can have speculations on how, how that works today. But at, at this moment in time, uh, all the major political parties and candidates would basically round up people, uh, get them drunk, all right, and pay for their beer, and then say, vote for me, okay, when they were drunk. Uh, that was pretty standard operating procedure. Both of the, all the candidates did it. Uh, and um, there was an election taking place that day, and it it is, one theory is that, in fact, he had uh, gone there and had, had some, had a little bit to drink because he was uh, probably allergic to alcohol. It, you know, wreaked all kinds of havoc on him. And he just passes out and, and unfortunately dies in 1849. Um, a few points to make about the short stories um, and a couple of points about your posts uh, at this point to consider. Um, in the Telltale Heart, uh, you know, one of the key ideas that, you know, the, the killer justifies you know, justifies his killing of the old man whom he says he loves, um, is that he focuses or obsesses on the eye. The point just to keep in mind is this ability, but the ability to just focus on the eye, to obsess on the eye, uh, allows him to dehumanize the old man. Basically, the old man just becomes the eye. Okay, let's just, you know, put aside whether he's crazy or not for the the time bearing, because this process of objectifying the, 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 the old man to his eye allows him to no longer see him as a human being, friend, uh, and allows him to kill the old man without really thinking about it. In fact, seeming to derive a fair amount of pleasure uh, for, you know, for doing so. Um, other issues we could consider is, is, is his pleasure killing the killing the old man or is the pleasure killing the old man and almost getting away with it because the pleasure that he seems to arrive from trying to hide the body chopping it up and all that i, I love how poe just 
uh, kind of as I cut up the bodies, you know, and it's basically uh, this really dramatic point is brought up in um, a sentence or two, and it was kind of passed on very quickly, uh, which may be, given who's speaking, the narrator, uh, a way the narrator's trying to pass over the gruesomeness of his acts, just to kind of hit a point that you probably already got. Um, so another idea that I, I, I hope to, you know, ask you to think about from the black cat uh, goes back to perception. We've talked about perverseness, um, but also uh, some of you wrote about guilt and um, but very few of you wrote about guilt and the black cat. Um, um, meanwhile, that's, you know, guilt is pretty big in the black cat and it might actually be structuring how the narrator sees the second cat, particularly that, you know, the the white that appears on the on this black cat. Um, there's a really kind of chilling moment in the story when uh, he believes that he sees a gallows in in the on um, the white on the black cat that it's transformed transformed over time. Uh, key question to ask yourself: Is this uh, in fact true? Probably not. Is the narrator seeing the gallows? You know, much like somebody might. Uh, see an image of the Virgin Mary and some toast, uh, you know, not to, not to be blasphemous, but just to kind of say it's the person who sees the image may in fact be projecting that the image is there rather than that the image has been put there in the toast by uh, a divine being. That's just, that's my point with that. Um, and so much of the story, so much of the first two stories and, and the third are directed by the narrator. The narrator controls the narrative. I, I know I made this point in the uh, in the in the notes, but um, virtually nobody wrote about this, and it's a really important point because if you are the narrator telling the story, you are structuring the reality for the reader. Okay, and so this is this key point is something not only to consider for Poe, but to consider for all the works we're going to be reading this semester. Um, finally, with The Pit and the Pendulum, um, you know, a key, no, virtually, absolutely virtually, nobody wrote about this one, uh, I assume because it was a little slow and sometimes difficult to figure out what's going on. Uh, a final point to just to kind of take away from this is the Spanish Inquisition uh, is supposedly doing these wonderful, you know, killing in the name of uh, of a higher justice. Okay, in this instance, of a religious justice, uh, are, and they feel compelled to do the most horrific things. I mean, crushing somebody or having somebody fall a great distance uh, to be mangled uh, below. Um, doesn't seem like a particularly moral way of killing. And so uh, keeping that in mind, um, our next two works are going to be looking at murder and um, you know, terrible things uh, taking place um, in the name of some type of good, right? And much like we see with the, with the Inquisition. And um, our next, our next text is Medea by Euripides, and this is a Greek tragedy, and uh, I'll be speaking to you about Greek tragedies in the next video. Okay, so bye for now. Uh, the next video, you won't have to look at me, uh, and um, we'll be focusing just on some sheets. Thanks.